mimic having them. So you take OxyContin, it's like you're having more opioids. And opioids are pain relievers. So it causes them to, it causes you to have more pain relieving chemicals. There's another way that drugs can act. They don't have to uh, directly act on receptors. They can actually act on, um, they can act on enzymes and how enzymes break down things. So enzymes can do a couple of different things in the body. Enzymes can break down neurotransmitters. And if they break down neurotransmitters, that's going to cause the signal to be, uh, the, sig the signal can slow down or decrease over time. So if you have uh, a dopamine uh, recycling enzyme, a dopamine recycling enzyme, and you have an increase of that, what's going to happen to your response, to your response, uh, your um, dopamine in your brain over time? Yeah. Dopamine's going to go down. Do you understand that? If you have more dopamine destroying enzyme or dopamine metabolizing enzyme or dopamine restricting enzyme, if you have more of that, dopamine's going to go down. You have less dopamine over time. Yes? If you block that enzyme, then you have more dopamine over time. That enzyme cannot break down dopamine. The thing is, the point to understand about this is you can get the same response two different ways. You can either increase your your uh, you can increase yeah. your your stimulus by having an agonist, or you can decrease the action of some sort of a thing that slows this pathway down. Why, like the pain receptor drug, you can block the pain receptor drug's uh, ability to respond, and that would actually reduce. Is there I don't know if it's better. It's just different ways of getting the same thing results. I'm sure you could, I'd better just pick what the answer is like, <laughs> what does that mean? It's more effective. Effective. Yeah, I guess it depends on the pain or still feeling better? I, I guess it depends on the situation. I don't mm -hmm. have an answer for that. Good yeah. question. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. So the one thing is, uh, agonists, do you think the more that you have, the more that you have agonists? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make sense in my head. It does make sense. I can't comment on that. You're asking, you're asking some great questions. And, um, Agonist or antagonist more addictive? I'm going to guess agonist, but I, that's just a guess uh, based on what? Yeah, so who knows? So you've got this restriction enzyme, or re the cutting <coughs> enzyme, it breaks down the ligand so that you don't have that response, or you can inhibit that enzyme so that you have more of that response over time. So, so you can either pass it. One increases response, and one decreases response. So which one of these is going to be a stimulant? Which one's going to be a stimulant to you think? The bottom one? The bottom one's going to be a stimulant, so it's going to be stimulant. Yeah. Which one's going to be a inhibitor? Yeah. It's going to be an inhibitor where the response goes down. Yeah? You get that? Mm -hmm. like, duh. A lot of these mo molecules will be found in other places. For example, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter in the brain, but it's also found in uh, your muscles when it's used to uh, activate your muscles. It's a neurotransmitter. It's like a, it's a, a chemical signal that causes your muscles to contract. If you inject acetylcholine in your muscles, they'll contract. But acetylcholine is also a neurotransmitter in the brain used for nerve to nerve signal. A lot of these, mo these molecules are uh, recycled or used in different ways in different parts of the body. So what could be an inhibitor in one part of the body could be a recycler in another part of the body. Or axon itself, the complex molecule, can be doing something in the brain, but also could also be doing something in like the blood body system. It could be doing more than one job. Yes? Yes. That's what causes tetanus. That's what causes tetanus is the acetylcholine. Tetanus is the acetylcholine flight. 
Okay, another way yeah. you can inspect, you can is going to by affecting the recycling transport. If you guys know about the recycling transport, the recycling transport is take yeah, that neurotransmitter and put it back in the synaptic bulb. So you've got this neurotransmitter in the synaptic bulb. And the search enzyme is going to be by mimicking everything to let the neurotransmitter into the body. Uh, certain enzymes, certain enzymes, certain ones. So this, so what happens is the uh, the uh, neurotransmitter gets released by exocytosis into the synapse, this area right here in the synapse. So that neurotransmitter gets released. If it doesn't get recycled, it just hangs around there and will cause another active potential, which means you'll have more of that active potential. So you need to get it back into, you need to get it back into there. Yeah? So it's in So what you end up with cycle transporter is going to put it back in that area. So it's like, I'm going to go like, put it back in there. Cool. Yeah. 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 And then you've got the other way of doing it is you can inhibit that recycling so that the recycling transporter cannot work. If it doesn't work, then that, in, then that neurotransmitter sticks around. Cocaine, cocaine acts on this one. Cocaine is a recycling transporter blocker, which means it, it doesn't actually um, <coughs> it doesn't actually increase the amount of dopamine that you produce. Cocaine actually just increases the duration of the, the, that dopamine phase in the by being a recycling transfer of block. So does it keep the enzyme from coming down in the first place, or does it kind of make it not work when it's really out there? It blocks it. It blocks that enzyme. I think it gums it up. It gets in the way. That's what I think is happening. Yeah? Uh, you the so the digestive enzyme, or the breaking down enzyme, they actually destroy the neurotransmitter. They clip it. They break a piece off of it and make it non-functional. The recycling transporters don't destroy the enzyme. They just put it in the, they put it back in the cell. It's out of the way. It just gets it back in. So it'd be the difference if we were like a recycling. If we're doing a human example, a recycling transporter would just take people out of the hallway and into classrooms. A destroying enzyme would just straight up start chopping them in the hallway. Just take a katana and just chop them in half. Both would reduce the amount of humans in the hallway, but one of them keeps the humans. take the raw material, or we take that broken one and we put it back together yeah, inside yeah. the cell. We have, we have other enzymes that build. We have enzymes that are builders, we have enzymes that are destroyers. The machines that do all the building in, in, the, in the body, those are enzymes. Yes? Uh, kind of point with food, but isn't it a lot more efficient if you cycle it back in there instead of destroying it and making a whole new uh, neurotransmitter? Why don't we all just set it up? Why don't we keep breaking it out? Like, you know, it's not really efficient. Uh, I, I, don't, I can't comment on the relative efficiency. We have to look at the the dynamics of the system, it might be more efficient to just break them down because you could use those those broken down things for other things. Like when you break down ATP, you can use that AT, that broken down ATP for other things. One of them uses an interchemical signaling device. It uses a broken down ATP which they use inside of the cell to signal different things. So yes, no, the body uses those broken down pieces almost immediately for other things, or rebuilds them very quickly initially. Um, I want to still decide which one to use. Like, why is something like that? I think everywhere we can decide which one to use. Like, it's not an easy answer. I don't know. Maybe we haven't had one in a real while. But it's going to be whatever is energetically the most efficient and survive in the evolution of consciousness. Evol evolutionary consciousness. It's not an easy It's not a good answer. That's why I was saying. Can we find your question? That's a good question, too. 
protein too, right? You guys remember that? Yeah. Chocolate and caffeine. Oh, yeah. Maybe there's some chocolate and caffeine. You know, one has three methyls, and one has two methyls. That methyl, that methyl does change its protein too. So <laughs> we're going to go with that. Alex. Hopefully that's correct. Yeah, that's genius. It is. You guys are genius guys.
Last year, as long as possible, sure looks like this, uh, sure looks like this, uh, uh, this arranger is the longest lasting. And if we had set a higher amount, the lower reach might get down to the But of course, you know, mainline, you're putting it right into the guy's mm -hmm. blood vessel. Well, you get it, you get it quick. You get it quick. Isn't that what the tech says too? They said that you know about human anatomy. Yeah, yeah. Claire, hey, hey, Claire, how you doing? Where does this drug need to go before you have to feel it? Brain. So what's the quickest way to get to the brain? That's the, that's the question that we're going to answer. We're talking about method of delivery. What's the quickest way? <laughs> <laughs> Inject it directly into the skull. Oh, I'm sorry. You got that. Let's see. Before the drug gets to the brain, where does it need to go? The heart. Blood. The blood. It needs to go to the blood. We're working our way backwards, okay? Oh, yeah. So before it gets to the brain, it needs to get to the blood. Before it gets to the blood, where does it need to go? The heart. The heart. Before it gets to the heart, where does it need to go? Well, that depends. That's where we start to get the difference, okay? All drugs are going to go heart, blood, brain. They're going to go that in that order. They're going to get there. But then the method of delivery depends on that and how many steps before that, yes? Okay. So... Where does it go? Straight there, right? Go to the 
vein, then it's got to go to the liver, then it's got to go into the heart, but it's not, you can't get to the brain yet because it's got to get oxygenated, and then, does that make sense? It's just the flow, the direction of the blood flow. So it's a bit different between each other for the lungs, heart, and lungs. So which of these barriers in such a blood distribution is not uniform? The placental barrier, the blood-brain barrier, the hepatic barrier, the lung barrier, and the skin barrier. You guys know what those barriers are? The placental barrier, what is that? I'm sorry, what? It's in the womb. It's between the mother and the developing fetus. It's a blood barrier between them to prevent infections and toxins from crossing into the different into the developing fetus. Right? What's a blood-brain barrier? Yeah, it's in the meninges, it's in the, uh, oh boy, that, that's, between the meninges and the brain is a blood brain barrier. It's four close. Oh well, yeah, I forget what it's called. Or the uh, arachnid plate. Yeah. 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 So anyway, the blood brain barrier, what's the blood brain barrier do? It prevents blood, things in the blood from getting into the brain. It's a blo blocker to keep chemicals out of the brain. Obviously, if the drug works in the brain, it passes the blood blood brain barrier. Hepatic barrier. What's a hepatic barrier? The liver. It's the liver. All blood goes through the liver on its way up. Right? And the skin barrier, which is blocking things from the outside coming in. So, what do you guys think? This is sort of the lung. What? Oh, the lung barrier. What's the lung barrier? The blood lung barrier. It prevents toxins from the air getting into the lungs. So what do you guys think? Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Mm -hmm. Ideas? This is tougher. Mm -hmm. Anybody know? Mm -hmm. The blood distribution is not I uniform. What that means is that it's not spread equally throughout the body. Thank <laughs> you.